Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We'll be right back with today's guest, but we want to give a shout out to our partners, the Global Community of Women in High School Sports, the Florida Coaches Coalition, We Coach, and Vital Signs Wall of Fame. You've heard me say many times, these are four great organizations. You should really have them in your network. And now, don't hit that fast forward button. Stay with us for the next three minutes. We're going to give our sponsors their shout out. These are all companies that I used as an athletic director. You should be using them too. Here we go. We want to say thanks to Home Campus for their support of the podcast. Home Campus is the exclusive high school and state association management platform for the podcast. It's also your one-stop platform for things like scheduling, student-athlete eligibility and clearance, coaches clearance, and a whole lot more. As an athletic director, I used Home Campus every single day, and it was just fantastic. And the Home Campus team was great to work with, too. To find out how you can uh, be a part of the Home Campus program, all you have to do is go to homecampus.com. That's homecampus.com. Check them out today. We also want to say thanks to Snap Mobile. Go to snapraise.com. Check out their entire suite of platforms designed to help you do your job better. If you're looking for a fundraiser, stop right here. SnapRaise is hands down the best fundraising platform you can find. They even have a program where you get your money before you actually start your fundraiser. Nobody else does that. Go to snapraise.com. Check out the entire suite. We also want to say thank you to Hometown Ticketing. Hometown is the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. And if you go to hometownticketing.com, their team is going to show you how to set up and sell your tickets online, not just for athletic events, but things like school plays, dances, uh, concerts, even graduation. You'll find it all at hometownticketing.com, digital ticketing that offers more. We want to thank Gipper for their support. Gipper is the official social media graphics solution for the Educational AD Podcast. And if you go to Gipper.com, their team is going to show you how to start creating world-class marketing content for your school's social media channel. It's so easy. Even I can do it. Uh, Gipper's used by over 3,000 high school and college athletic programs around the country. And it allows you to really step up your social media game. The kids are on social media. And you need to be there too. So go to Gipper.com. Mention the podcast. You'll get a nice little discount. That's Gipper.com. We also want to say thanks to Huddle. At Huddle, we believe in sports and teams believe in Huddle. As a football coach, I used Huddle for years. But when I became an athletic director, I made sure that our school was a Huddle school. And our coaches just loved the tools that Huddle provided to let them coach our kids up to their highest level. It was a complete solution for the challenges that we all face as ADs. At Huddle, we believe in sports. Teams believe in Huddle. Join the 8 million users. Turn your school into a Huddle school. We also want to say thanks to Vital Signs Wall of Fame. You know, they're on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. If you're looking for a really cool way to showcase your school's accomplishments, your school record boards, even your school's Hall of Fame, go to Vital Signs Wall of Fame. Check out their interactive touchscreen video consoles. Okay, Mention the podcast, you'll get a nice discount. That's vitalsignswalloffame.com. We also want to say thanks to Sideline Interactive, indoor scoring tables and video boards. Go to sidelineinteractive.com. Um, schedule a live web demo and see their scoreboards and their score tables in action. Probably one of the best purchases I ever made was our Sideline Interactive Indoor Scoring Table. Uh, tremendously versatile, and the customer service is just outstanding. Go to sidelineinteractive.com. Schedule that live web demo today. That's sidelineinteractive.com. And we want to say thanks to Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. Athletic surveys are a quick, easy, and an affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire program. Athletic directors 
already hear back from the complainers, the 2% that want to gripe about everything. Athletic Surveys will connect you with the 2%, but they also connect you with the 98% that supports your program. And that's a tremendously valuable tool to have when you're talking with a frustrated parent or your principal or even your school board. Go to athleticsurveys.com. They're going to create a custom survey that will let you take the pulse of your parents and your student athletes. That's athleticsurveys.com. Let them help you take your athletic program from good to great. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We are going to Bristol, Connecticut, and ESPN today. We're going to be visiting with Tiffany Fritz. Tiffany is the Senior Manager of Fan Engagement at ESPN. Uh, we connected on a webinar that she was part of. I thought she'd be a great guest, and she very graciously agreed to come on. Got a tremendous background in athletics and promotion, uh, business development, digital marketing. She was an uh, assistant SID at West Virginia University, Go Mountaineers. Uh, yeah. And uh, she's going to share with us today. So, Tiffany Fritz, welcome to the Educational AD Podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, you and I were talking uh, before. It's a busy time. We're recording this on August 18th, so it's going to be pretty timely when you're listening to it. Tiffany, we always like to let our uh, listeners have a chance to get to know our guests. So give us that quick bio, where you were born, uh, where you grew up. Maybe take us up through your own uh, high school and college years, then we'll take our first break. But uh, what's the Tiffany Fritz origin story? Sure. So I am from Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, some people know where that is, and obviously you can Google it to figure it out. But for for quick reference, we always say uh, about two hours north of Pittsburgh. Um, and so grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, not a small town by any means, but definitely a smaller city. So it was nice because we had, you know, big high schools, big sports, um, one of them, which I went to McDowell High School in Erie. Um, but we also were small enough to where people knew each other, you know, you got to um, know people at other high schools, you got to know your teachers really well and that. So I always call, you know, a, a big small town, uh, but definitely far from that. So Erie, Pennsylvania, McDowell High School, uh, played sports my whole life. Uh, my mom was an athlete. She was one of those, um, I would say, athletes in unorganized sports where it wasn't something she went straight through, but you could hand her a football and she could throw it. You could um, put out, you know, a mat and she would do a backflip. Like she was very athletic herself. And we, my sister, um, brother and I were raised to also be like that. So sort of played all sports and then really ended up focusing heavily in soccer and then volleyball um, ended up being what I went into high school playing for club and uh, in high school. Unfortunately, like many uh, high school athletes that aren't as familiar with playing in college, I stopped playing to go work and to do the things that uh, many athletes do. So I definitely appreciate uh, coaches, athletic directors, people that stick with the students to try to get them to stay in sports. Um, what I realized, though, after that, and this is how I chose where I went to college, was that I didn't want to stop sports altogether because I stopped playing them, unfortunately. Um by the way, still to this day playing pickup leagues. So I, I have not stopped fully, but it's something that um, always was a little bit of a regret of mine. And the way to make that right was basically to work in sports. And so went to West Virginia to, to major in journalism, minor in sports communications, and worked for the athletic department, as you mentioned, starting my junior year through my senior year there. Uh, and yes, diehard Mountaineer fan, um, everything West Virginia. I love it. Um, ended up shortly after that, moving to Charlotte to start my career. Wow. Uh, great story. And I, I love to hear the stories. Um, now you said you were just south of Pittsburgh. So I got to ask, I grew up in Oregon, so don't, have, there's, it's a long story, but I'm a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan, even when they <laughs> were, that's how old I am, you know, uh, when they were crappy. So are you Steelers or Eagles in your household? So neither, actually. Um, a lot of people from Erie are surprisingly Cleveland Browns Cleveland fans. Cleveland Browns, right. Um, right. And we're almost right in the middle of Cleveland, Buffalo, and Pittsburgh. So you get people going all different ways there. Um, we like the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, I will give Pittsburgh that. And we really more go heavily toward all Cleveland sports. Right. All right. Okay. Well, we got that out of the way. I um, <laughs> want to ask you a question. Uh, again, you talked about your high school sports experience, you know, playing yes. on clubs. 
but she didn't play collegiately. You know, I went to a small college, you know, the D ones weren't interested in me. And then I like to joke, I, I injuries and a lack of talent kept me out of the NFL. Um, for you, when you uh, stopped playing competitively, you know, making that move to college um, nowadays, and I don't mean to make light of this, but nowadays you hear about high school athletes that struggle with letting go of their career, that they were just so wrapped up in being a student athlete. Um, you know, you and I both found ways to stay involved in athletics. You know, uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I wasn't going to make the NFL, but I, I just love football and I was a track guy too. I love coaching, you know, Hey, I, I can get paid to coach. Uh, so yeah. looking back at those days where you were no longer, you know, competing, you know, any, any challenges or anything like that hit you? Yeah, actually, I didn't notice it as much until I started working in athletics at West Virginia. And it was because I covered football and basketball. Um, really, everybody in the athletic department covered those at a school that big. Um, but then I was directly assigned to tennis and rowing um, since I was sort of the you know undergrad newest uh, intern there always got the sports that were either, you know, new coaches or they weren't winning at the time or those. And it was nice because they were sports that I really wasn't super familiar with and had to educate myself. It was when I picked it up for another colleague, I covered volleyball for a weekend for a tournament and I struggled, you know, and it was because it was the first time that I was covering a sport that I used to play and no longer played. And as I'm watching it too, I realized even when I would play pickup, I was playing with some of those athletes that were out there and I never knew I just was playing pickup volleyball in college and was playing with them and I'm just sitting there thinking you know what everybody does is like what was what was I thinking in high school to do this and and that was really my first time struggling to say you know oh I thought I just wanted to work in sports but like maybe I should have continued playing and you have to balance okay I didn't so now how am I going to to keep going in sports but I I really had a very I don't know strong feeling in high school of just you know, I need to move on and I need to do this. And so I always try now to encourage my siblings, you know, friends, kids, everybody to to stay in sports as long as possible, because whether you finish them in middle school, high school or professionally, whenever you get done, you sort of don't know what to do because you were an athlete. Um, I will say, though, that almost every person that I've ever worked for, they say you can tell that you were an athlete before and they love hiring former athletes, whether you were good or not, because you're coachable. And it's something that really goes over into sports, whether you are um, sorry, whether into your work, whether you work in sports or not. No, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the teamwork aspects, you know, goal setting, overcoming challenges. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, those are skills that any employer wants. I go on one more question before we take the break. You mentioned that you covered rowing. Now, yeah. you know, you're a volleyball player, you're an athlete, you know, you, you know, you, you're going to have that look. Did the rowing coach at West Virginia ever approach you and say, Hey, you look athletic. Have you ever thought about rowing? Because I, I hear that so often, particularly with women. Yeah. So um, I got that a few times with a few different sports, but no, rowing was not one of them. I feel like rowing athletes are just a different level of athletic and strength um, that I don't know if an average person can just pick up and do that. When I watch some of their train, their training and the way that they, I mean, they were out in freezing temperatures on the water at 4 a.m. practicing. Like it was just beyond. And so I do feel like rowing was one of those ones that, you know, they don't want the person who is just athletic. They want the person that is, you know, diehard athlete. And they are 100 percent dedicated to strength training and everything around that. So no, the coach did not. Also, our coach at that time for rowing. Um, was very, very dedicated to the team he had, not the team he used to have, not the team he's going to have. He was in the moment. And so he was, he was one of the few that never did, but I did have um, the volleyball coach mentioned that um, I had a few different coaches wonder what I was doing, working it, um, but that's okay. You know, that was why I ended up realizing, even if it's for fun, I need to keep playing. And so I, I have up through adulthood as well. Right. Well, and again, that's great. You know, you, you walk away from that conversation you know, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I still got it. You know, they, yeah, yeah, completely. <laughs> yeah. Hey, for our listeners, uh, our guest today is Tiffany Fritz. She's the senior manager of fan engagement at ESPN. We're going to hear some more about that later in the podcast. Let's go and take our first break. Uh, this is the educational AD podcast. 
We want to say thanks to Home Campus for their support of the Educational AD Podcast. Home Campus is the exclusive high school and state association management platform for us. It's also your one-stop platform for things like scheduling, student-athlete eligibility and clearance, coaches certification, and a whole lot more. As an athletic director, I used Home Campus every single day, and it was just great. And the Home Campus team was great to work with, too. To find out how you can join the Home Campus team, all you have to do is go to homecampus.com. That's homecampus.com. Check them out today. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. Tiffany, you kind of took us on that journey through, uh, you know, high school and college, you know, out of Pennsylvania into the mountains of uh, West Virginia. Um, talk about some of those post-college jobs. Very few of us ever get to graduate from college and have that dream job right away. So what were some of the stops for you that led to your current position at ESPN? Yeah, so I definitely didn't get my dream job right away. That's for sure. I actually got, uh, I will say the word rejected by ESPN at least three times before I ended up getting hired by them. <laughs> uh, yeah, only three. Um, and But I will say that the SID position at the athletic department as a student, technically, um, they had us doing the same thing they had their full-time staff doing. And it was one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. And it was amazing because it really gave you insight to working in sports, working overtime, working weird hours, um, working around people who were, you know, of all ages, local, non drunks over, you know, I mean, it was really sometimes depending on working in sports, it is, it's tough for people because it's a weird atmosphere, depending on what you do. And being an SID was amazing because I got to do all of it before I even went into the true job force post-college. Um, so my first couple of years out of college, I moved to Charlotte right away, um, had a job offer that actually ended up they relocated before I even got there. So I was already in Charlotte with no job. Um, so what I did was pick up pretty quickly to pay my rent, um, a digital marketing position. And it was one that was very heavily entry level, um, working with a lot of different industries, uh, nonprofit, uh, real estate, automobile, you know, several. And it was one that it was not ideal to what I wanted to do because I wanted to be in sports. But getting into sports sometimes is the problem in the first place. And a lot of times when I go to colleges and speak now, I talk about any resource possible for people to find that job right out of college, because I remember those couple years, um, not bad, great experience learning about that in other industries. But the whole time you're just thinking about getting back into sports again, because when you work in something like, you know, um, real estate, which is a fast paced industry, it still is slow in comparison to sports. Like sports are just so you know, high speed all the time. There's always something happening. There's never an off season, um, morning, afternoon, nights, weekends, all of it. Um, so you do almost get a little bit bored in a way of, okay, so when can I get back in? Um, and so I think the whole time I was working as a digital marketing consultant, it was great experience, good education, especially because I went to college at an interesting time that we didn't have a ton of the social media, um, but as I was coming out, we did. And so we were really the first sort of generation to work in it, I guess right. I'll say. Um, I I don't even think, I'm pretty sure they didn't have Instagram, you know, nothing like that when I was in college. So you didn't market that way. And so I really had to learn as I was graduating, okay, how do you market these events on Twitter? How do you market them on Facebook, on YouTube, and then eventually on Instagram? And so I was really sort of growing up with the promotion of anything as it was being developed. Um, and it was a good place to be at that moment in digital marketing. About three years after was when I went back into the sports world again. And that was with a company that was the official ticket package provider for uh, the NFL, NBA, UFC, um, Kentucky Derby, and several other partners. And what we did was really take a large quantity of tickets that they had that were either tough to sell because of the price point or tough to sell because of the location, um, several different reasons. And we would package it together with uh, food and beverage, transportation, uh, meet and greets with athletes behind the scenes, any of that. And so uh, that's actually where I worked for about four years um, before 
reaching out to ESPN and getting the call back for an interview where they flew me up to Bristol. And then I, I moved here in 2016 for my job with ESPN. There you go. They finally came to their senses, right? Yeah. I know three times, three times at three different stages of life, but I ended up where I was supposed to be. You know, you you made a comment early uh, and I want to follow up on, a, I hope we're not going off into the weeds here. Okay. Um, you talked about working in different um areas, you know, real estate, et cetera. And it wasn't, you know, as fast paced, uh, actually even before that, um, as the intern at West Virginia, that you were yeah. doing the same stuff as, you know, the full timers. Um, d did you come across, were there people doing that in the SID in the athletic department that had not had a plain background you know they were let's say journalist or tech people but they oh, yeah. they didn't have the sport experience and here's where i'm going with this you know i i think it's that you know being in the huddle and you know competing and practicing and doing all that i think and you and i talked about this it prepares you for real life and challenges and things like that yeah. um so i guess my question is you know in those trying times those fast-paced jobs you know did your athletic training pay off for you and for somebody who didn't have that they might have struggled yes yeah and I think it still does today honestly um almost any job I've been in I it it has helped um I don't think it's necessary I do think that people um believe that to work in sports you had to have played sports and that's just not true I think some of even our most brilliant minded people at ESPN didn't play sports. They just always loved sports. Um, there's even some people I work with that don't love sports and they work in them, you know, to them, it's just another industry. So it, it definitely varies and it's not completely necessary, but it, it was beneficial for me for a few reasons. I think the team atmosphere is huge. Um, being able to not be so focused on working independently because you are part of a team, even if your job is very independent and that helped because of sports, especially um, who you work for, you know, that can always vary. You can have a great leader. You can have a really tough leader. You can have one who doesn't show much emotion. You can have one that is overreactive. You know, you never really know. And I think when you play sports, you're constantly working with different coaches as well and figuring that out as you go also. So there is a lot that transfers over into work life but then especially if you work in sports if you played prior right no and, and i agree you know you don't um i i had some great coaches as an athletic director or as a head football coach that you know didn't play football um but they had you know wanted to or the i, I had a history teacher come up to me one year i was the new head football coach at a school and he said boy the kids are talking about how much fun they're having you know i want to be a part of this you know is there anything i can do um we gave him a script said, okay, you say these things. We took him out over the weekend. I said, this is what it looks like. This is what we want to see. And he was a quick learner. I said, you say these things. Everybody's going to think you're a great coach. And he he was a great person and a great teacher who became a great coach. So uh, okay. again, you, you don't have to have it. Very good point. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you one ESPN question before we uh, you know really get into that. Yeah. When you first you know walked in the office, you know that first day, oh. that first week, I can imagine how I would have been. I would have been fanboy all over the place. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, how was it for you coming in there? You know, again, it's kind of that dream job. Uh. Yes. So um, I would say it was more my interview that was where I had a little bit of an intern meltdown, I would call it. Um, that when they called me for an interview first, I'm like, okay, I've had three interviews with you guys. You know, I don't know how far this is really going to go. This was the first one though, at the headquarters. Uh, the first one I did um, right out of college that was in Charlotte at their event office. The second one was in New York city at their marketing office. This one was at their headquarters. And I remember them saying, okay, we're going to fly you to Bristol. And I was like, that's when it hit me like, wait, Bristol, Connecticut, you know, the, the heart of the worldwide leader of sports. Um, it's also not not a bad location. It's just not one that people are dying to go to. So you're really, if you're not from there or working there, you're not really going to know to just randomly stop in Bristol and see ESPN. Um, and you also can't get on campus unless you're, you work there or friends of family of people that work there. And so it was just that moment that I remember thinking, okay, even if I don't get this job, I'm going to take in this experience so heavily because I may never come back again. And I just, I want to see it. I want to feel it. Um, and I remember getting there and just being completely over overwhelmed with 
the scope of sports there. Um, I think there's, you know, 16 or more buildings just in one one campus they call that's why they call it campus because it literally feels like a college campus for adults surrounded with sports um and then one building will be all people you know on television one building will be all studios another will be all in the the department I actually went in working wasn't fan engagement it was the stats group um and then there's one entire area that it's all people just tracking games, pulling stats, sharing stats, doing highlights, you know, that it it really was overwhelming for someone who is a sports fan, because you get there and you're just like, so this is where it happens. You know, the stuff that I've been watching, I think working with a league prior, um, or I'm sorry, with uh, the athletic department, you get really the behind the scenes of how an event is executed. When I worked with the hospitality company, that was more of, okay, so this is really how tickets and field passes and how all that works. This was very much like, this is where people really display it to the rest of the world. The people that can't go to an event, you know, this is where it happens um, and where they can watch it. And it they mean it when they say worldwide, we had every language, every country. So getting there for my interview, I was just like, you know, I had that imposter syndrome that I think a lot of women, especially, but a lot of people in general get where I just got there and was like, do I belong here? You know, like I have a really good history in sports, but I don't know if it's quite up to par with this. Um, But once I was in my interview, it felt right. And the job I was there for felt right. And I remember leaving and calling my mom, like, I think I might have to move to Bristol, Connecticut, because I'm pretty sure I just got the job. She's like, how do you know? I'm like, it's just one of those moments where I left the other ones not feeling great. And I left that one like, no, this is a really good fit. Um, And I think once I knew I'd come back, I stopped having that uh, feeling. I will say it did help too, that I didn't watch too too many sports. Like I was, there's some people who they grew up watching nothing but sports and they were obsessed with, you know, sports center and ESPN. I really didn't. I played more sports. I didn't watch them often. So I didn't really know who many of the talent were, you know, so if I saw them walking around, I didn't get too starstruck. Um, I think really at the time when I started, the only one I was super familiar with was Stephen A. Smith. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like everyone knew him because he was the most vocal out of anybody. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I knew that, but I didn't really get a starstruck because I wasn't raised watching ESPN. I was raised playing sports um, and I really fell into the sports capital and it was amazing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, we're going to hear more about what uh, what you do at uh, ESPN, but uh, thanks for sharing that. For our listeners, uh, we're visiting today with Tiffany Fritz. She's the Senior Manager for Fan Engagement at ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Um, let's take another quick break, but we're coming back. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to thank our good friends at Snap Mobile for their support. Go to Snap raise.com check out their entire suite of platforms designed to help you do your job better if you're looking for a fundraising platform stop right here snap raises hands down the best one available they even have a program where they will give you your funding before you actually start your fundraiser nobody else does that but there's a whole lot more you've got snap store snap connect snap manage you'll find it all at snapraise.com. that's snap raise Dot com. We also want to say thank you to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. Go to hometownticketing.com. Their team is going to show you how to set up and sell your tickets online, not just for athletic events, but things like school plays, concerts, school dances, even graduation. And here's the best part. Every single account is assigned a dedicated client success manager that's going to provide hands-on support every step of the way. That's every step of the way. Hometown Ticketing is digital ticketing that offers more. Go to hometownticketing.com to get started. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. Tiffany, one of uh, my favorite parts of the podcast is when I ask our guests to share some of the mentors that they've had so far in their life. Uh, None of us get to where we're at on our own. Uh, The expression that I always use is, I still hear those voices of my mentors. I still hear those voices in my head. So uh, do you hear any voices? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, And I've always struggled with this question um, only because I never had any real official mentors. I don't know if that is 
I, I guess I, I do know it's partially my fault um, for the fact that I was someone for many years that wasn't very vocal. Interesting now that I'm extremely vocal, um, but I I didn't speak up much. Um, I also didn't wouldn't ask somebody uh, to, you know, really if I if I had a meeting and I loved how it went, I wouldn't say, hey, can we stay in touch? You know, I'd be over overly grateful that they met with me that time and then, you know, go about my way. Um, and so I think that I struggled with mentors because I really just didn't stay in close contact with a ton of people, assuming that, you know, they had better things to do with their time. You know, I was lucky I even got the time that I got. Um, then as I got older, I started to realize how beneficial having mentors would have been where, you know, even if it's somebody that you don't know super well, or you really only cross paths with them once, um, just letting them know their impact and staying in touch is extremely important. So that's another thing. Whenever I talk to students, I I understand not everybody has the personality to go to a networking event and leave with three mentors. That just, that was not my personality. And I really struggled with that. There also wasn't as big of a focus on mentors as there are now. People vocalize it a lot more um, that no one really ever said to me, like, who's your mentor? You know, it wasn't until I got older that people started asking me that question. And I'm like, I honestly don't know. You know, I, I struggled a little bit with, um, the industry that I was going into. I think coming from the city I was coming from, um, the family that I was coming from, all of it, you know, again, we had people that love sports, but I didn't really have that person that I wanted to follow. I actually used LinkedIn <laughs> to my benefit of where I would go on LinkedIn and find somebody in a position that I wanted to be in one day and I would look at their history. And then if it was something that seemed attainable, you know, I would try to go about it that way. So I almost was developing my own mentors as far as, oh, I saw someone speak. I loved what they said. Um, and then I would go back and follow up on what their history was and go that way. Now, you know, fast forward 15 years after getting into it, um, I have had some great mentors recently that I, I've been vocal the last few years, really speaking up of like, hey, I love the route you took. I love your values. You know, I want to stay in touch. And I do. Um, and those those mentors have been great. But really getting myself to that place of really asking for it was a, a tough one. No, I, I, uh, I see a lot of similarities. Um, you know, I, I, obviously I think for all of us, you know, our parents were mentors in, in, in many different ways, Exactly. but, uh, professionally, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I guess, hesitant to reach out. I didn't want it to appear like I didn't know what I was doing or, you know, that I was somehow yep. deficient, uh, and, and at the same time, knowing, that these people could have, uh, you know, helped me tremendously. So uh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I guess looking back career wise, you know, have there been some people that have um, impacted you? And we always make the joke. Some people yeah. are mentors in a good way and not oh, in a good yes. way. Uh, yes. Have there been some people that have impacted you in a positive way at this point in your career? And we know that you've got many, many, many more great years ahead of you. Absolutely. Um, I think even, you know, going back to childhood, my mom was a huge one. I think she was one that was great because she, the things that she didn't accomplish, she also made sure that we would want to accomplish those. Um, so it was very much of, okay, if I wasn't the role model in that area, here's what I did that was wrong, you know, try to go about that. So she sort of helped that early life of having the confidence to do whatever I wanted, because she always had sort of that hesitancy that she didn't do it. And she didn't want us to go that way. So she was really big on, you know, if you need to move, move, if you need to, you know, take a job that you may not like, but it'll force you to do whatever, take it. Um, so she, she definitely didn't do what I call, I always joke about the guilt trip. You'll get sometimes if you go past where anyone else did and, you know, your direct family, they'll try to pull you back in. She was the opposite. It was very much, you know, go do what you need to do, move where you need to move, come home when you need to come home. And, and she gave me the freedom to not feel bad about doing that. I think my boss at West Virginia was a really great one. He was, relatively quiet overall. Um, but he sort of just threw me in. And I think we can get into later about leaders in general, like you said, you know, good or bad leadership, but he was one that by throwing me in, I remember getting very overwhelmed, but I did have this sense of trust from him that made me feel like I could do it. Um, I came in, you know, the youngest intern, one of few females in athletics period at that point. And it was just that moment of, again, 
can I even do this? And he was very much like, yeah, you can. And you're actually going to go do it with very little training because I hired you for a reason. We, we already liked your work, go do it. You know? Um, so he gave that confidence early on. And now I specifically look for managers like him that really have trust in you from day one. Yeah. Um, those people that, uh, impact you, it's maybe at the time you don't often realize, you know, to the degree that they're yes. impacting. And then, you know, at the next step, we'll teach, you know, what would so-and-so do or, or those type of things. Absolutely. Great. I write thank you notes later right. in life. I went back of, okay, who is the, who are the people? And every year I write a few thank you notes to people from history that I realize now I should be really grateful for. So he's gotten one. <laughs> okay. Well, and again, talking about leadership qualities, I don't think enough people understand how impactful that written thank you note is, um, you know, it's, we talk about tools in the toolbox. That's a tool I picked up way too late in my career, but then I tried to make up for it. You know, I, I'd write thank you notes to everybody because it's, it is so impactful. Very cool Great. stuff. Uh, we're going to take another quick break. Uh, our guest again is Tiffany Fritz. She's the senior manager for fan engagement for ESPN. I know we've been teasing you a lot, but we're actually going to get into that in our next segment. So please stay with us. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to thank our good friends at Gipper for their support. Gipper is the official social media graphics solution for the Educational AD Podcast. And if you go to Gipper.com, their team is going to show you how to create world-class marketing content for your school's social media channel. It's so easy. Even I can do it. Gipper's used and trusted by over 3,000 athletic programs, both high school and colleges across the country, and it's professional design made simple. Your kids, your student athletes are on social media, and if you're not promoting them, promoting your team and your program, you're really missing out. Go to Gipper.com. Mention the podcast. You'll get a nice little discount. That's Gipper.com. We also want to say thanks to Huddle. Go to Huddle.com and change the way you see the game. As a football coach, I used Huddle for years, and it was just fantastic. But when I became an athletic director, I made sure that our school was a huddle school. And our coaches just loved the tools that huddle provided that allowed them to coach our kids up to their highest level. It was a professional grade solution to the challenges that we all faced. Go to huddle.com and see why we believe in sports and teams believe in huddle. Join the 8 million users. Turn your school into a huddle school. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. We've been visiting so far with Tiffany Fritz of ESPN. Uh, Tiffany, your your title at ESPN is the Senior Manager for Fan Engagement. Now, you know, we already talked about my propensity to be a fanboy, you know, with uh, the on-air personalities. But from your position, what do you do? And I, I guess why is it important from an ESPN perspective? Sure. So when I came in uh, to ESPN in 2016, I was in business operations, um, which kind of led me to this role. It sounds totally different, but it actually is very similar, um, specifically around the stats group. And I did more internal you know, education events, sponsorship um, within our own staff because the company was so big. This role with fan engagement, the reason why it appealed to me when I moved over to this role, this would have been in... 2021. Um, so it was interesting to have a fan engagement position in the middle of a pandemic um, when sports, a lot of sports weren't really taking place, um, but switched over to this because I really did want to begin more interaction with the fans directly and not so much behind the scenes on the business side. Um, so really what I do is focus on getting fans to stick around, um, driving engagement with the content that we have. So that's really anything from, you know, getting fans to watch, getting fans to to stream, to read articles, uh, to watch live sports versus on demand on ESPN+. Plus. Um, and we do that across all of the sports leagues and events. And so it really requires a seasonality focus uh, is a little bit of what I've been calling it recently, because I started to realize that 
sports are interesting for many reasons, because not everybody who is a fan of a sport is a fan of another sport. Um, sometimes you get the overall, what we call diehard fans. And if you bring them in for one, they're going to start consuming the others. Um, then there's other fans that they really, you know, they watch golf and they only want to watch golf and really how to appeal to them as well of, okay, well, here's some other golf content or here's, you know, most of our golf fans also watch blank or blank, you know, pushing them that way. Um, so it's really just making sure that we're not just trying to bring people in, but my role at engagement, the term when they use that, they mean it. Okay. Once they get there, what are we doing? Um, I really don't have any input onto bringing the fans to us. It's more, okay. If they're here, if they're watching, or if they only watched one, once um, or only read once, you know, how do we get them to stick around? What did they seem to like? Uh, how do we make it a really good experience for them so that their journey through all of the ESPN content is as easy as possible? And we don't just say, you know, hey, come in for this game. And then right when the game's over, you leave and you may not come back. It's really getting fans to, to stick around and serving them the right content at the right time uh, and making sure that we don't just forget about them once we have them. <laughs> So you, you mentioned um, statistics and, uh, and and data, and you know we, we don't want to you know totally geek out here, but um, I, I guess what are some things that you know you look for? Uh, maybe that peek behind the curtain that you know the average fan looking they don't realize that that that's happening. Uh, I don't even know if I made if that's a coherent question. Yeah, I think I think so. And you can tell me if I'm answering it right. Um, but yeah, data is a huge part of my job. I think uh, a lot of times now, because things are so digital, whether that's, um, you know, social media or streaming or whatever it is, you can track a lot more than you used to be able to of really what fans are doing. So, you know, we don't go too far into the like, who are they? What age? Where do they live? Like that. I'm not interested in all of that. And I think as a whole, we're not, it's more into categories of are these international fans are these domestic fans or you know are they consuming all sports or are they consuming one sport and like really trying to break it up by that to make sure that we're serving the way that we should um is it you know someone who's more interested in collegiate sports or is it someone who's more interested in the big one-time football game you know and, and really breaking it down by that so i i do get in the weeds of data but i try not to get so far in um and most of it you know depending on where you are, you don't even have that data. So you really work with what you have. Um, but we care more about that fandom data. Um, how big of a fan, what type of fan. Um, and then I really dig into those. I think when it comes to information, you know, that I may care about that another person doesn't, it's a lot more of how many times are they coming back? That's a big one, because I think sometimes with um, streaming, especially since I focus heavily on ESPN plus now, um, people are binge watchers, you know, they'll come in and stream for 12 hours straight and then never come back on something like a Netflix. ESPN is different because live sports happen all the time and only last a certain amount of time. So my concern is more, hey, come back tomorrow for this or come back next week for this and really making it clear that there's more that exists than just that, you know, one series you watched all day or that one event that you watched all day. There's, there's more going on. Um, so really trying to educate that way. Yeah. Um, I tell the story and it's a true story. Uh, this is a hundred years ago. You, before you were born, yeah. um, I'd, uh, you. you know, just made a move, uh, got an apartment, got the cable, the old cable TV hooked up, uh, and was going to be watching ESPN for the first time. So I, I click on the TV, you know, change the channel and I'll never forget the announcer going, you know, it's a beautiful day for barefoot water skiing. Uh, it, it, it's like it was ESPN, the Ocho, you know, but this was back right. in the, in the early eighties. Yes. I'm just going, seriously, where's my football? Where's my basketball? Right. Uh, and now, uh, I know they're incredible athletes, but, and I could never do any of the things that I'm about to criticize, <laughs> but I just X games, give me a break. Okay. Get them out of here. You know, hey. give me my football, basketball, baseball, softball, soccer, you know, I, swimming. I love watching swimming and skating in the uh, Olympics, but X, X games, games is one of my favorite. Oh my goodness. Okay. We might have to end this interview early. I, I know. I know. <laughs> trust me, especially because I actually am, am older than technically the target demographic for X games. The reason I love it is because I went to an X games event and I had never been before. This was prior to ever working at ESPN and it was mind blowing to see in person. And I remember thinking, 
thinking, man, I thought this was just, you know, a bunch of skateboarders and bikers and whatever. And that talent was out of this world. And the event atmosphere was crazy. I remember leaving and going, all right, fine. I'm an X Games fan. (laughs) No, and and I I joke just a little bit. I know they're incredible athletes. I'm going to share one more story. This was 1987. I'd just been hired as a head football coach at this school in Oregon. And I'm driving to the uh, meet the coach, meet the kids event. And as I'm pulling into the parking lot, here's this kid, tall, lanky kid, you know, got a uh, probably an early version of a mullet um, (laughs) on his skateboard and just, you know, skateboarding down the street to the gym. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh, geez, I hope I don't have a team full of this. (laughs) Um, And that kid, uh, he was a junior, was a wide receiver for us that year, all conference, his senior year. We moved him to quarterback. He was an all-state quarterback for us and just a great kid, just a fantastic kid who also was pretty good on a skateboard. Uh, and and again, yeah. it, was a, it was a great, you know, shut up Jake <laughs> lesson for me <laughs> that, hey, don't judge these kids on the skateboards. But uh, I'll never forget how we I all felt. It. I never forget how I felt pulling into that parking lot just going, oh, geez, skateboard kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here, this is a full circle moment because I will say the best fan engagement I've ever seen on site at an event was at the X Games. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been to a lot of sporting events and they did the best job of getting the fans involved. So there you go. Okay. Well, this cranky old uh, guy, uh, <laughs> he's give me my football, but uh, I get it. I understand. <laughs> Listen, I'm, you're a category of fan too. We I, have I'm not, I'm not people. your demographic. I get it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, for our listeners, uh, we are very fortunate today. We're listening to, and we're going to listen to more of uh, Tiffany Fritz. She's a senior manager for fan engagement at a little place called ESPN. Let's take another break, but we're coming back with more. So please stay with us. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to say thanks to our good friends at Vital Signs Wall of Fame. If you're looking for a really cool way to display your school record boards for all your teams, for all your sports, or your school's Hall of Fame, go to Vital Signs Wall of Fame. Check out their interactive touchscreen video consoles. Uh, it's a great way to showcase your school's diverse history, your proudest moments, and your best and brightest. Go to VitalSignsWallOfFame.com. If you mentioned you heard about it on the podcast, guess what? They'll give you a nice little discount. That's vitalsignswalloffame.com. We also want to say thanks to Sideline Interactive indoor score tables and video boards. Go to sidelineinteractive.com, schedule a live web demo, and see their tables and their scoreboards in action. Probably one of the best purchases I ever made was our Sideline Interactive indoor score table. Of course, we use it for home games, but we also used it for pep rallies, for signing ceremonies. It's tremendously versatile, and their customer service was just outstanding. Go to sidelineinteractive.com. Schedule that uh, live web demo today. That's sidelineinteractive.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. Tiffany, you and I were talking, and I, I kind of shared that, you know, many athletic directors, you know, they want to promote their teams and their athletes and their events. You know, they, they work to engage on social media and, and all the things that um, weren't even around uh, when I got started as an athletic director a long time ago. From your perspective, uh, as someone who's, you know, worked, uh, you know, as a division one SID and has worked, you know, now obviously at a national level, what are some things that you think athletic directors maybe can do better from a promotional standpoint, and maybe if if you can, how can they do it better? Sure. Um, so a couple of things stand out to me that I know we use a lot at ESPN, and I think a lot of teams are picking up as well um, at the professional level too, is really getting embedded in the community. Obviously that is huge to anybody, um, but I think sometimes it's a little bit taken for granted as almost a publicity stunt in a way of like, we went out and did this, you know, um, someone's there covering it totally fine. Like that's not the issue. It's more the fact that you really need to be embedded in the community for the community to care about what you're doing also. Um, And that's at, you know, the mass level and the high school level, the college level of um, some people will go to watch events and tune into things and attend things and purchase things that they never would have just because they're involved with 
somebody at the school who had an impact on them, whether that was the athletes going out um, or anything else. Uh, really where we focus a lot are more of those, um, I would say like cultural months, um, having, you know, Women's History Month, Veterans Day, Disability Pride Month, Black History Month, like really honing in on those as almost a guiding tool. That doesn't mean, you know, the only time we focus on women's sports are during Women's Women's History Month. Like we try to heavily make sure of that. But that's a really good guiding tool for sometimes how to get embedded in the community and the audience is okay, maybe during this month, we have some of our former athletes come, um, some of our students come, some of our staff, like recognize them at the event because people like to see other people acknowledged and they also like to be there for them. And so you think even if it's, I'm using Women's History Month just as an example, because clearly that comes to mind first. Um, But you can also too, you know, have a sponsor for that game be a female owned business in your community. I mean, you can really bring in the community in so many ways that aren't just going out and volunteering. It's a lot more bringing them to the events that you have um, and acknowledging that and making sure it's past, present. um, Because I do think, especially with high school and college athletics, um, parents are just as much involved. The locals are just as much involved. You know, it's not just about the students and the people that actually go to the school. That's just a portion of it. Um, So that's that's one example, I think, of a, a really sort of authentic way to get involved that you get everything from athletes, parents, students, and local businesses involved. No, And I think those are all spot on suggestions. Um, there, there was a period of time, I think in f- talking about high schools where it was almost a kind of a hands-off approach with parents, uh, not so yeah. much the community. Of course you wanted their sponsorship dollars, uh, yeah. but you know, p- thanks parents. You know, we got this covered and, and now even at public schools, definitely in private schools where I spent a lot of my career, it's not dealing with parents because <laughs> yeah. between you and me, you do have to deal with them sometimes, but you no, know, <laughs> now we want to partner with parents and we're going to reach out and, and let them know, Hey, we want you involved. Uh, this is an area we want you. This is an area with, that we do have covered, but, uh, that engagement thing, uh, what yes. you do fan engagement. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, even with the parents, I get that I have not worked in that, but I do get it. I have friends who have and understood I am newly a parent of two, and I will try to remember that years from now, um, so that I'm not that parent, but I do think too, like, you know, a lot of, especially if people in the community played or a lot of people go to the schools that their parents went to, maybe their parents were an athlete there. Maybe their parents were something that you can bring them back for a specific night or, or, you know, any type of acknowledgement. So more, when I say involved more that way, um, I'm going to push aside, you know, having the the verbal involvement because I'm not educated in that area. No, no, no. I, I, I get that. that's always going to be there. You know, um, I, I would tell our coaches, um, you know, we, we will talk with parents. We will listen to parents. We're not letting them drive the vehicle, but they are on the bus and they're along for the ride. So let's make it a pleasant ride. And most of the time, you learn this parents, they just want to vent. Uh, you yeah. know, they, they know they're not going to convince you to start their child at libero or quarterback or whatever it is, but they, they, they just want to vent. So you yes. thank them for coming in, but uh, no, that, that engagement, it, you know, colleges figured this out, I think a long time ago with alumni um, lists yes. and alumni <laughs> requests and all that stuff. Private schools, of course, in that same model, you know, but public schools are starting to recognize that. And across the country, you know, I've been able to visit a lot of different schools. And when you walk in, let's say to that gym, you can tell right away if there's some community engagement, you know, from the number of parents, uh, the banners, uh, the things that you talked about that are engaging that group. Um, If you want to have that winning culture, that championship culture, parents are a great way and community are a great way to to make those things happen. Yes. And local businesses drive so much um, in general that if, you know, they put a sign up for a game that's happening 
and you put something up about them being a part of the event, you know, like the give and take there is huge. And we do that again on sort of a massive scale, but usually when we'll have a sponsor, we sort of return the favor and do something differently as well. It's that, it's that back and forth, I think with the community, but I only really use the calendar as an example, as a way to start, I think until it becomes habit. And then once it becomes habit, you don't really have to just dedicate specific, you know, weeks, months and that, Um, but it's a good time to say, okay, you know, who should we go to now? Well, it, Disability Pride Month passed in July. Like, let's go to those athletes, you know, from our Special Olympics or who, you know, manufacture wheelchairs in our community, you know, anything and really get them involved. And there's always something that can be tied into sports. And, and that's another great point. The more you do that as an athletic director or as a coach, and it's it's not easy, you know, you got to get out there and do it. But the more you do it, you're going to reach that tipping point in your community where now they're going to start coming to you. You know, hey, you know, we saw this company, you know, was involved with halftime or whatever it was. We'd like to get involved. How do we do that? And when that happens, you know, that's when you can relax a little bit, but not too much. You still have to go out and keep developing. Great ideas. Okay. Tiffany Fritz, look at you, athletic director. I have plenty more. Just keep asking. Um. Once again, for listeners, we've been visiting with Tiffany Fritz from ESPN. Um, I've got a hundred other questions, but uh, it's that time of the podcast. Um, You know, you are not an athletic director. I think you could be a great one, but uh, we're going to take our final break and we're going to hear from Athletic Surveys who sponsor our toolbox segment. When we come back, I'm going to challenge you to send out a brand new athletic director on their very first job but I'm only going to let you put three things in their toolbox. So let's take that final break. And when we come back, we're going to hear what Tiffany Fritz of ESPN is going to put into her new athletic director toolbox. Please stay with us. We want to say thanks to athletic surveys for sponsoring the toolbox segment of our podcast. Athletic surveys are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire athletic program. Athletic directors already hear back from the complainers, the 2% that want to gripe about everything. Athletic surveys will connect you with the 2%, but they'll also connect you with the 98% that love your program. And that's a tremendously valuable tool to have when you're talking with a frustrated parent or your principal or your school board. Go to athleticsurveys.com. They're going to create a custom survey that allows you to take the pulse of your parents and your student athletes. That's athleticsurveys.com. Let them help you take your athletic program from good to great. Well, it's that time of the podcast. We've been visiting today with Tiffany Fritz, the Senior Manager for Fan Engagement at ESPN. She's not an athletic director, but she certainly knows her way around the world of sports. Uh, But right now I'm going to challenge her to send out a brand new athletic director on their very first job. But I'm only going to let her put three things in the toolbox. So, Tiffany, what three items are going to go into your new athletic director toolbox? Okay, can I explain them too? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, So I would start first with a calendar of events. Um, That seems like a sort of a boring first tool to put in, but it is one that has helped me in every single sports job I have had because I think breaking it up helps. It doesn't seem as overwhelming. Um, You kind of break it up by what are the big moments? You know, what are the, the games or the events that most fans are going to want to be a part of, or that you've always seen big attendance then what are those moments that you really don't see attendance or you really struggle to get people involved and sort of pinpoint those? Um, And then lastly, you know, what are the areas that you could do something all season long? So breaking it up that way, I've been able to break up almost any job in sports I've ever had is, okay, what are the huge ones? How do we, you know, learn from those ones? And how do we keep them big, I guess I'll say, then what are the small ones and what is the strategy we can use to build those up based on the bigger ones? And these aren't all three, by the way, this is one tool. Right. Um, and then uh, the the all season, what can we do that we can implement the whole season across everything um, on the fan engagement side? And then you have those three tiers and it helps you build a little bit of a different strategy since it's different for all of them. No, uh, uh, any athletic director, young or old, they're going to have that calendar, that day runner 
uh, their cell phone calendar, you know, that organization, it, it, it's got to be there. Yeah. Okay. The second one I would say is um, being immersive. And and that's where that, enga- that fan engagement comes back in is fans want to be involved, um, you know, listen to them, hear what they liked, what they disliked, if there's complaints, which all of us don't want to hear, but sometimes those help, you know, I work a lot across our customer service department to hear, okay, during that, you know, pay-per-view fight, what did people love about it? What did people hate about it? And then kind of taking that to build off of. Um, But when I say being actually immersive in it is not only just listening to the fans, but really giving them insight into what you all do every day and what do the athletes do, you know, giving, Maybe people can at some point get a behind the scenes tour of something. Um, They could get invited into the press box. They could, you know, get to sit on the sidelines during something, Um, you know, really anything, even if it's game day trivia that's up on, uh, you know, Jumbotron or whatever you can do of what's this athlete's favorite food? Like, how do they prep for this game? You know, different things like that, just really being immersive and trying to make sure that fans are involved in what you're doing, because I think the the big focus is making everything about sports um, and going back to what really matters. And that's the athletes, the games, the coaches, um, and really just getting them involved in it. Unfortunately, most people will never see that behind the scenes. Uh, so unless we really show them or, um, you know, they won't ever really get to know the coach. So maybe help them get to know the coach. They won't ever get to see how the players practice. So, you know, show them some sizzle reel, like whatever it is, just really being as immersive as possible so that the fans feel like they're a part of the game, even if they will never step foot on the field. Yeah. Uh, w- that tool that you just mentioned, it's going into one of our categories, but no one has ever used that word immersive before and it's a great Ooh. word I, I love yeah. it's just so visual great great tool all right what's your third one okay the third one would be using your students um as much as possible this is across i think every industry but i think it's sometimes taken for granted that we have students at our fingertips at all levels this is you know high school students college students even for professional leagues and places like ESPN going back to students at local colleges or high schools or whatever it is, using them to help you with the engagement. So whether that is, um, you know, being the ones to design your graphics, being the ones to um, write feature stories or, you know, teach you about a new technology that came out, build um, highlight reels of your athletes, you know, like students are learning as we speak. And a lot of times they know more about certain things than we do. And we just sort of accept that not only is a lot of times it's free, you can, you can pay it if you want to, but it's free, but it's, it's experience for them as well. Most of the experience I got prior to my job at the athletic department was just within whatever school I was in. It was, you know, writing a feature story on an athlete or covering the stats for a team that didn't have anyone to do that or whatever it was. Um, And that's what I built my entire resume off of. And uh, my entire, uh, I guess I would say portfolio was based off of things that I just did on a project basis for fun because somebody let me do it. Um, Nobody paid me and it allowed me to have a resume when really otherwise you wouldn't. Um, I think using the students for that. And also, I, I don't think any of us like to admit it. People use Instagram like crazy now. They can help you build out, you know, an area where you're holding up a championship trophy and it's like an, with a backdrop and it's an Instagrammable moment, that kind of stuff. Those are areas that we don't really want to waste the time doing, you know, like we're focused on the sport, but like let the students do it. They love it. It brings in more people. It's it's free marketing, um, all of that. So really just taking the talents and the special areas of your school and, and using whether that's Photoshop, you know, graphic design, whatever that is. You know, absolutely. There's a number of athletic directors I could list that have done just that, you know, they've kind of turned over their social media department to students in house. Certainly there's oversight, but, uh, Uh, Another aspect is, and I've done this at three different schools. The sound you hear now is me patting myself on the back. Um, (laughs) We had students that, and they had to audition. They were our game day public address announcers. And these, they did all sports. They did football, volleyball, basketball, baseball, you name it. And all three went on to collegiate announcing careers, uh, Northwestern, uh smu 
and Florida State University right here in the, in the state. So uh, you yeah, have, yeah. as Tiffany just said, listeners, you've got talented kids at your school right now. They might not be on a team, but they're still sports geeks. They love sports. You know, let them uh, help you do the things you want to do. You know, promote the teams, promote the athletes, promote all your programs, uh, utilize that student help. Great suggestions. Hey. Yes. I was one of the students that helped um, prior to getting into it. So right. I was on the on the field taking pictures. They didn't have to hire a photographer and I got to put it in my uh, portfolio of another side of sports. So I think the students are begging to to have something. Oh, without a doubt, you know, get them involved. Uh, you, you'll be so very grateful. Tiffany, this has been so cool uh, spending some time with you. Uh, we always do this. Um, if one of our listeners wanted to reach out and, yeah. and maybe pick your brain, I don't want to, you to get buried, but uh, I know you're on LinkedIn. Yep. Um, is there another way to connect with Tiffany Fritz? LinkedIn is actually the best way to connect because I stay pretty up to date on there. Um, and really anything that I've spoken at, even, you know, high school assemblies, you know, I always offer that up, reach out on LinkedIn uh, because I'm happy to answer questions and people usually, you know, take me up on that, at least a couple from every event. And it makes me happy because uh, again, LinkedIn was my go-to to figure out who to talk to in the industry. So I'm happy to, to help in any way I can. Oh, well, we appreciate you spending time with us uh, today and uh I think ESPN is doing okay, but all the best uh, moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Hey, we're all just trying to get better. So even ESPN. Hey, uh, for our listeners, uh, we do this just about every day and we upload the Zoom recordings to the Educational Lady Podcast YouTube channel. Of course, we appreciate you listening. Come back next time for another great interview and just about every day for new content on the Educational Lady Podcast.